Let's pray as we uh, dive into the word of God and, and listen to this message that we got for, that God has for us today. Let's pray. Um, God, we just thank you that you're good, God. Again, we, we invite you here with us today as we study your word. God, we pray that you would fill us with your wisdom so we can understand your word, we can apply it to our lives, God, um, so we can understand faith more um, and what it looks like to have, put our faith in you. Um, we thank you for your son, Jesus, God. We thank you that, um, that even though we've been sinners, even though we've, we've done wrong, that you sent your son and, and to die for us and to rise, rise again, that so while we were still sinners, that you, you sent Christ to die for us and through him that we can have forgiveness of our sins and be right with you and we thank you that you're good God we love you and we pray this in Jesus name amen the scripture that we have um, to look at today is very, very fitting for Father's Day. Um, and I would like to say, like, I planned this. You know, like, I'm just, like, ahead of the game. And I was sitting down. I was planning our sermons. And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm planning this chapter four of Romans for Father's Day today because it fits so well. But I didn't. It just so happens that we're in chapter four today. Um, we've been going verse by verse through the book of Romans. And um, we're in chapter four today. And it was just a coincidence. But it was a good coincidence. I think it was God's will. I think God put that together. So it's awesome. Um, so we're going to be in chapter four today. We made it through chapter one, two, and three of Romans. And if you were here for those weeks, you know that was just full of bad news. It was just like bad news after bad news after bad news. Like you're a sinner. Like you don't do righteousness. You do wickedness. Like you can't do righteousness. You just do wickedness. And everyone's a sinner. And you might think that you're a good person. But like aside from Christ, you're still a sinner. And it was just like a bunch of bad news, right? It was not super fun to look at and to talk about. But we talked about in order to really drive home the need for some good news, to drive home the idea like, hey, you need some good news, Paul really, really has to harp on the bad news for three chapters. And Paul explains how, how everyone's guilty. Both the Jews and the Gentiles are guilty of sins. And because of this, because of our sins, we're separated from God. And then Paul presents some, some more bad news. The more bad news is that you can't work to be righteous with God, that you can't do anything to fix that. You can't work by yourself to, to, to do good, right? People are unrighteous, and the unrighteous people can't obtain righteousness by working hard, right? And this is bad news for anyone who says, I'm just going to pull myself up, and I'm going to do good, and I'm going to save myself, right? Paul says you can't. And then Paul presents the good news, and the good news is this, the gospel, that we've all sinned, that we've all fallen short of the glory of God, and that all are justified freely by the grace through Jesus Christ, the grace that comes through the redemption of Jesus's, Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection. And this is the good news, that when we put our faith in Jesus, right, put our faith in his death and his resurrection, we are made righteous because he is righteous. It's not something that we have to work to do. It's not something that we have to do this good stuff to, to obtain righteousness. We put our faith in Jesus. We are made righteous because he's righteous. And that is good news. That is the gospel, amen? Y'all should be hooping and hollering because that's good news, right? Yeah, thank you, right? That's the good news. And the good news is this, that we are reunited, reunited with God through Jesus Christ, the bad news is not just that we're sinners. Like that's bad news is that we're sinners, but the bad news is even worse than that. It's that because we're sinners, we're separated from God. That's the problem is that separation from, with, from God, right? Sin is bad and obviously it's bad on its own, but it's even worse that it separates us from God, right? And the good news is that we're not just forgiven of our sins, but we're made righteous and reunited with God. It's all about being in the presence of God, right? That's the good news because that's how God designed it for us to be, to be with him, right? And part of the good news is that we don't have to earn that. We don't have to earn that righteousness to be reunited with God. Being reunited with, reunited with God is a free gift for anyone who puts their faith in Jesus Christ. We talked about that last week. In, in Romans 3, 28, as a refresher, it says, for we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, or is God, not, God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith, do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. A person is not justified by the law, by doing good stuff. A person is justified by faith. And this is for both the Jew and the Gentile, right? Justification by faith, apart from the law. And then this brings us to a question, like it begs the question, why then have the law, right? What's the purpose of the law? Wasn't the purpose of the law given to the Israelites? So if you do this stuff, you do these good things, then I'll forgive you of your sins and make you, like, and make you righteous and save you. Like, wasn't that the purpose of the law? 
isn't it, isn't the law an agreement between God and his people that, right, if you do these sacrifices, you do these ceremonies, you live this certain way, then I'll forgive you and I'll, I'll wash you clean if you do these things, right? Wasn't that the, begin, our, the agreement from the beginning? And did that change through Jesus Christ, right? These are important questions, that for the, especially for the Jewish person that Paul's writing to. Right? How were the Israelites saved before Jesus? Have you guys ever thought about that? Like if Jesus came and he died and he rose again, what about all the people before him? Like how were they saved, right? If you, if, were they saved by the law before Christ and then Christ died and rose again and now you're saved through faith? Like did something change? And these are all questions that Paul is gonna answer in chapter four. Um, so there's a lot of good stuff in here, a lot of theology of just like knowing God more and understanding salvation more. So let's dive in in chapter four, starting in verse one in your Bibles and Romans. So open up your paper Bibles if you have it, otherwise it should be on the screen behind me. But we're gonna read, verse one says, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, wages are credited as wages, wages are not credited as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to the one who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he sp- speaks of the blessedness of the one who of the one to whom God credited righteousness apart from the works. Blessed are those who trans- tr- reading is hard, man. Blessed are those whose transgressions have forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against them. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was he accredited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteous that he, he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised, in order that righteousness may be credited to them. And he is then also the father of the circumcised, who not only are circumcised, but who also follow in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heirs of the world, but through the righteousness that came by faith. For if those who depend on the law were heirs, are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath and where there is no law, there is no transgressions. There's a lot there and we're gonna talk about it, right? So if you're sitting here and we go back to that question that we asked, why have the law if it doesn't justify? Like if the purpose of the law isn't to give people a way to salvation, what was the purpose, right? And the answer to that question is the law, the short answer is this, the law was never meant to justify. Like the purpose of the law wasn't to give the people a way to salvation. That's not what the law was. The law was always meant to preach the gospel. Like it was always meant to point to Jesus. Um, There was a misunderstanding that was very common among the Jewish people during this time, right? And the misunderstanding of the purpose of the law, the Jewish Jewish believers um, believed that the law was there to justify them. Like if they they did this stuff, then they would be saved and be righteous with God, right? If you follow the law, you do everything right, you'll be saved. But that was never the point of the law. The point of the law was never to give away to salvation. The point of the law was to show, was to point people to the saving grace that comes through faith in God's promises, a, prom- a promise that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. The point of the Old Testament law is to point us to Jesus. Like the point of the law is to point us to the gospel, to the good news. And Paul's mission in, in chapter four is to show how justification through faith is a consistent message found in the Old Testament. That this is not some like new thing. It's not a new concept of being saved by grace, right? Being saved through faith by grace. Paul was explaining that there was not one form of justification in the Old Testament and one form in the New Testament. And you're sitting here and you're saying, you're saying a lot of Christian church words I don't understand, right? What justification means, it just means being right with God, being made right with God. So in order to be with God, you gotta be righteous because he's righteous. Our sins make us unrighteous. So when we, be, God's righteous, we're unrighteous. We need, to be, we need to find a way to be made righteous to be with God. Does that make sense, right? And what Paul is saying here 
is the way to be made justified, the way to, be, way to be made righteous has been the same for all people of all time. Like there wasn't, there was not a change when Jesus came. It was fulfilled when Jesus came, right? And this is gonna be hard. This is a hard thing for Paul to, to convince the Jewish believers of because for so long they believed if you do the law, then you'll be saved. Like justification comes from, from following the law, right? And this is why Paul he points straight to the guy, to Abraham, to the main guy of their faith to say, how was Abraham saved? Like, let's look at Abraham, one of the original Jewish person, right? The one that God chose to, to give the first promise. Let's, let's look at Abraham and ask the question, how was Abraham justified? Was it through his following of the law? Was it through his works of him being a good person? Or was it through faith? If Abraham is justified by, by doing good things, Right, then it would make sense that we all have to do good things to be justified. But if Abraham is justified by faith and by faith alone, then we're all justified by faith. Right? And if you're not familiar with Abraham or you need a little refresher on, on who Abraham is, Abraham is the patriarch of the Jewish people. He's like the OG father of the Jewish people. Right? He, that's Abraham. He is the one that God chose to make the promise of, um, to make his promise to, a promise that his family would be God's chosen people, that they would have as many descendants as, as people, as the stars in the sky, um, a promise to give his family a chosen land, the promised land, and a promise that all people on earth would be blessed because of his descendants, right? So when we talk about Abraham, Abraham, you have to know he's the guy. Like he is like the George Washington of like the Israelites, right? He's like the original guy. That's kind of funny. I just made that up. I don't know if that's true or not. Right, but Abraham's like the guy. Like he's like the one where they look back and say it all started with Abraham. He was the pro had the promise. Right, Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. Jacob's name was later turned to Israel. So you have the Israelites, right, who are also called the Jewish people. The Israelites are straight de are descendants from Isaac, from Jacob, and, and Isaac to Abraham. Right, so it all started with Abraham. So before there was the Israelites, there was Abraham. So Abraham's important. That's what you gotta understand. Abraham is, was an important guy in the faith. So it was a common idea that the reason that God chose Abraham was because he was better than everyone else. Like that he was just an awesome guy. That's why God chose Abraham. That's what the Jewish people believed, right? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. The question then is, why was Abraham like chosen? Was he made righteous by God or was he righteous before he was chosen? Right? So let's look, look back at that story in Genesis 15, um, one through six. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but you can. Um, this is the story that Paul references in chapter four, right? And it's a, it's a long story, but this is just a, a short section of that. It says this in Genesis 15, one. It says, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abr Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. For Abram said, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Elziar of Damascus? And Abraham said, Abram said, you have given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. The word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. So he took him aside and said, look up at the, at the sky and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, to him so shall your offspring be. In verse six, this is the important part. Abraham, Abram believed the Lord and he, and let me re, go back. Reading is very hard, man. I'm a math guy. In, in verse six, it says, Abram believed the Lord and he credited, credited it to him as righteousness. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to, to him as righteousness. Right? This is the story that Paul is referencing back then. And so basically you have Abraham and his name was Abram before this. And he, God tells him, you're gonna have as many descendants as the stars in the sky. And Abraham goes, I have no kids. Like what's the point of this, this promise if I don't have a descendant to pass it down? I'm just gonna go to my servant guy, right? I have no one to pass this, this, this blessing down to. And God tells him, I'm gonna give you your son and it's gonna be your own flesh and blood. And I promise you that, that I'm gonna do that. God chose Abraham to make this promise, right? And Abraham believed God. He believed the promise. Abraham believed God and believed him and it was credited to him as righteousness. Justification is being made righteous, being made righteous, being made right with God. Abraham was justified when he believed God, right? So all of that to say, when was Abraham justified? When he said, God, I believe you, right? And, and 
the, the original language, what Abraham probably said was amen. Like, amen. That means like, yes, I believe you, God. Right? Abraham said, I believe you, God, and was made righteous in that moment. And this is what Paul is saying in Romans 4, 3. Right? Abraham was justified by faith in the same way that we're justified by faith today. Right? It wasn't something that Abraham did that earned him that promise. It was a gift that Abraham received. Right? And this gift was received through faith. Right? And he was justified. This is no different for, for, for the promise that we receive from God, that God made, makes us a promise of salvation through Jesus Christ, and we receive that gift with faith, and we're justified. It's not because of our actions. And one of the major debates that was happening at this time when Romans and when Paul was writing, one of the major debates was between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers was, do you need to be circumcised in order to, to become a believer? And that was part of the original covenant that, that God made with Abraham, that you had to be circumcised as a sign of, of, your, of your faith. And there was a debate, like, do you, do you need to? Do you not need to? And this was a major, major debate at this time. And if you look back to the story of Abraham, when was Abraham credited as righteous? Right there in chapter 15, right? Abraham's not circumcised and not given that command until 13 years later, right? In chapter 17, there's like big, big chunk between those two chapters, right? But the circumcision came after he was credited righteousness. So what that, what that means is faith comes first. Like faith justifies you first before your actions, right? Faith came first and at the moment of faith, Abraham was credited as righteous, this does not mean if God tells you to do something, you can just be like, I have faith, I'm righteous, I don't need to do what you tell me, right? If God tells Abraham to get circumcised, right, he should do that, right? But faith comes first, right? And then after are your actions that follow as a sign of that faith. And this parallels like a debate that the church has today, and that's like on baptism. Like there's a debate in the Christian world today about like, do you need to be baptized to be saved? Like is salvation through faith and then you get baptized? Or is it like you get baptized and then you're saved? And like this is like a debate that people have today in the Christian world. And this parallels this so much here, what, what Paul's talking about in Romans 4, right? If you're, are you saved before or after baptism? And I think, it's, I think it's clear, right, that you're saved at the moment of faith. Like that you're saved, you put your faith in Jesus Christ and then you are credited as righteous in that moment, right? Once you put your faith in Jesus you're, and you follow him, you're justified. And then baptism follows as a sign of that faith, right? Baptism sign, it's a command, it's an important command that God gives us. Like you repent, have faith in Jesus and then become baptized, Right? And Jesus tells us that we should baptize, and believe it or not, we should obey Jesus. Amen? Right? So if Jesus says it, we should do it. But faith is, the save, is where salvation comes, is through faith. Justification comes through faith. And after faith comes actions as a sign of that faith. Right? So baptism doesn't save you. Faith in Jesus saves you. Baptism follows as an important sign of that faith. Right, so Abraham was not saved at circumcision, he was saved at faith. And part of that faith is revealed in obedience. And it's the same for us. We're saved through faith, and part of that faith is revealed through obedience to what Jesus calls us to do. Then the next question you might have, and I don't know if any of you guys are thinking this question or not, but the my question you, this next question you might have is, what about the law? Like, the law wasn't there yet. Abraham didn't have the law yet. So maybe when God gave Moses the law, something else changed. Like, maybe there was, like, a new thing. And to that, I would say, yeah, Abraham did not have the law yet. He did not have the, the, the commandments. He didn't have the Ten Commandments. He didn't have any of the law. Right? And what I think that proves is the law can't save. The law doesn't justify. If Abraham is saved, if Abraham is made right with God, then it can't be the law that what saves you. It has to be faith. Right? Faith is what, what justifies. If the law saves, then salvation is earned. Right? It's earned. It's not given. And Paul writes about this. And, it, and, it said, and he talks about how if a person earns their, their salvation, if they earn their faith, they can boast about how good they are. Paul explains is if you work a job, you are, you, are, you are due a wage, right? If you work, someone works that you are obligated to pay that person, right? But if someone does not work and you still give them like a check, that's a gift, right? That's, what, that's a gift. And in this, what this is saying is if you work really, really hard, you guys work hard in here, hopefully, right? You work really, really hard, you get a paycheck. You can take that paycheck, you can take it to the bank and you can buy cool stuff with it, right? If you have some money left over after paying all your bills, amen. Right? But if you work really hard, you buy a bunch of fancy stuff, and then you go to work and you tell your coworker, look at my cool truck I just bought. 
right? And you boast and you say, I earned that. I earned, I worked hard for my home. I worked hard for the things I have. And you can boast like, look how good I am, right? And that's what, if, you, if, if you're saved through works, if you're saved through the law, then you're, you have the ability to boast like, look what I've done. Like, look what I've done. So if you're justified by your own good works, you would be owed that payment. Like you don't, it's not a gift given to you, you're owed it. And let me tell you something, God is not in debt to anyone. Like God is so much higher than us. Like God is not in debt to us. He doesn't owe anyone anything because he's God, right? And if you could be justified through your own works, then you could boast saying, look how good I am. Like, look how awesome I am. Like I'm such a good person, I've received salvation. And when Jesus comes back one day, and you're standing before Jesus at the gates, and he's like telling, you're like saying like, you know, do I get to go in or not? When you, you stand in front of Jesus, if you let stand in front of Jesus and you tell him like, hey, I earned this, like look how awesome of a person I am. Like I've lived my life well, I treated my wife well. That kind of rhymes, that's cool. I didn't plan that. Right, I did good stuff, like let me in. If that's what you're planning to tell Jesus when you stand in front of him, right, you're boasting before God. And that's like a scary thing to do, right? No one can boast before God. But what I think we'll be saying when we're standing before Jesus and we're standing in front of him, we're not gonna be saying like, I'm so awesome, let me in. I think we're gonna be saying, you are so awesome. Like you are so awesome, I don't deserve to come in. Like, but because you're awesome, you let me in. Like we don't boast about ourselves, you know? And if we were justified by the law, you better believe you can boast about yourself. If you're justified by doing good works, you're gonna boast about yourself. But we're justified by faith. So when we stand in front of God, we don't boast, but we worship. Like that's justification through faith. It's such an important thing. And this is something that is countercultural to the world. Most people say the way that you become righteous is by doing good things, right? But that's not true. It's through Jesus Christ, through faith in him. And this is a gift given to the ungodly. Faith, the faith of the ungodly is credited as righteousness. And you might be sitting here going, yeah, like when you think of the ungodly people, think of ungodliness in your head for a second. You're thinking of some like horrible people, right? And you're kind of right, but you're also thinking of like us, like you and me aside from Christ. Like our faith justifies the ungodly and before Christ, we're ungodly, right? We're all ungodly apart from Christ, but because of faith, God justifies us freely. That's awesome, awesome, awesome. Then Paul references another major figure in the Jewish faith. If you were like, that's just Abraham, what about someone else? Paul references King David. And if you know King David, he was a guy after God's own heart, right? He was one of God's like, chosen kings, an important one. God made promises to David just like he made promises to Abraham. But you also know David did some pretty horrible things. Like David sinned in like some massive major ways, right? He committed adultery, he committed murder. Like he did some, like, some horrible things. And of all people, David understood that he could not stand before God and justify his life. Like he couldn't stand before God and, 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 and say, I've done good, right? He knows that he sinned and he falls short of God's glory. David could not boast before the Lord. So Paul quotes what David writes in, in Psalms 32, one through two. That's what verse seven and eight here are. And it said, blessed are those who trans, whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sins the Lord will never count against them. What David is saying is, not blessed is the one who messes up and then does a whole bunch of right things to make up with for that. What he's saying is, blessed is the one whose sins are forgiven. Like by doing, by not like your actions. Blessed is the one whose sins are covered up. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sins, he sees righteousness. Right? Blessed is the one whose transgressions aren't held against them. What, what, what David's saying here is, right, it's not like a blessing to have to work to do good, to cover up your sins, to make up for what you've done wrong. That's not a blessing. It's a blessing for God to look at us and say, you know, you've done wrong, but I don't see that. I see Jesus. I see the righteousness of Jesus, right? So both David and Abraham understood that we're not justified because of the good things that we do, or we're not justified because we are inherently righteous people, right? But they're justified because they had faith. Both, both David and Abraham were justified because of their faith. And then Paul continues in, in chapter 4, 16 through 25, and, it, and it's good stuff. Let's, let's keep going. It says, Therefore the promise came by faith, so that it may be grace and may be, so it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith in Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is the father in the sight of God and in, in whom he believed. 
the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham hoped in, Abraham and hope believed, so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without the weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regard, regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had the pro- power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Right, today being Father's Day, it's so fitting that we get to look at Abraham, right, the father of many nations, the father of all who believe. And we talked about how Abraham was credited as righteous through faith, right? That's how Abraham was justified, was by faith. Now I wanna look at what does that faith look like? What did Abraham's faith look like? And the first part of Abraham's faith that Paul writes about, the first part is Abraham's faith in God's ability. Abraham had faith in God's ability, that God was able to do what he, what he promised. Abraham believes that God can do anything. The first part of faith, church, is believing in God's ability, saying, I believe, God, that you're able. I believe, God, that you're powerful, right, that you're able to do what you promise. The promise that God made Abraham was that Abraham was gonna become a father, and Abraham believed this because he had faith in who God was and God's power, right? And you have to remember, Abraham was old, like old, old, like old, old, old. It says he was as good as dead, like he's old, 100 years old, right? So when, and his wife Sarah was also old. She was an old lady, right? They had, and to, up to this point, they hadn't had any kids. And at, up to this point, everyone would have told them, there's no way you're gonna have a kid. Like if Sarah went to the doctor, they would have said, why are you even here? You're 100 years old, you're not getting pregnant. Leave, like you're not allowed, what are you doing? You know, there was, there was no, they had no kids up to that point. There was not a lot of hope that they would have kids now. Like, if you look at this with, like, the worldly mind, Abraham and Sarah were not going to have kids. Like, why even think about it, right? But he had faith. Abraham didn't question God's ability. He had faith in God's ability. In verse 16 and 17, it says this. It says, therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace, it may be guaranteed to all of Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed, the God who gives life to to the dead and calls into being things that were not. God gave Abraham a promise and Abraham had faith in that promise because Abraham understood that God is able to do anything. Like God is not defined by like our worldly expectations, that God can do anything. And it says God is the God who gave, gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. God is able. The first part of faith is understanding that God is able, right? That God can do anything. The second part of Abraham's faith is understanding that our circumstances and challenges do not limit God's ability. Like our stuff around our lives, like what we're going through, where we're at in lives, do not limit God's ability. In verse 18, it says, against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, and Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave God the glory, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. Like I said, Abraham was old, as good as dead. Sarah was old, her womb was dead, like as good as dead, right? There was no worldly reason for them to get pregnant, like none, right? There's no worldly reason for them to have any hope of getting pregnant, right? And Sarah, that Sarah would have a kid in their old age, it was not happening. It did not happen yet. It was not gonna happen aside from from God. But their circumstances and their challenges in front of them, as they looked so unsolvable and they looked impossible, Abraham didn't look at the circumstances, he looked at God's power. He said, God, you're able. The circumstances around me, that's, they, are, they are what they are, but you're still able. 
right? The circumstances and challenges in front of them looked impossible, but Abraham still had faith. And he had faith that God did not, was not limited by the circumstances. God's power is not limited by circumstances and challenges. The last part of Abraham's faith was that he trusted in God's promise. In verse 21, like I said, it says, being fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The word it was credited to him were written for, not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins. It was raised to life for our justification. Abraham was fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he promised. No matter the circumstances, no matter the challenges, God is able and, do, will, and will do what he promised. And this is faith. This is what faith is. It's understanding God is trustworthy, understanding that God is able and that he will do what he says he will do. God kept his promise to Abraham and Abraham had a son, Isaac, right? And from there, many nations were born. We have the same faith of Abraham. Right? When we have the same faith of Abraham, when we trust God's ability, when we trust God's power to overcome our circumstances, and we trust in God's promises, we become children of Abraham. Right? We are a part of that promise. And the promise is this. The promise that we, may, that we must have faith in is this, that God raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, that he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life. The first and most important promise we must put our faith in is that Jesus was crucified on the cross, that he rose again. And when we put our faith in him, we are justified and made right with God. We are saved through the faith in that promise. We are justified, right? But our promises don't end there. There are so many more promises that God makes to the believer, right? Read this book, right? And it's just full of promises that God has for you. Having faith is having faith in Jesus and his death and resurrection and having faith that God keeps his promises. So this Father's Day, remember Abraham's faith.